A modern airliner is a technological marvel. It is the safest way we can travel over long distances. But it hasn't always been like this. 100 years ago, travel by air was an adventure, but risky. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm an airline captain and instructor. In this video, I will show five great innovations that made aviation safer. In 1844, we got the telegraph. In 1876, we got the telephone. In 1897, we got the wireless telegraph. And in 1900, we got wireless radio for voice communication. The first radios were bulky, heavy, and reliable, and had limited range. When the first airplanes took to the sky, the military leaders soon saw the potential to localize enemy troops and direct artillery fire. The first time an airborne telegraph was used operationally was in the Italo-Turkish War, which lasted from 1911 to 1912. The first air-to-ground voice communication took place in the United Kingdom in 1915, but because of technical limitations, they saw limited use in the First World War, and it will take about 20 years before radios were good enough to be used efficiently. This is the radio operator station in an aircraft from the 1940s. The invention of the transistor made it possible to make much smaller radios than before. Today's radios are light, reliable and easy to operate. Aircraft approved for IFR flight have at least two VHF radios, and it's also a requirement to carry an HF radio when flying over oceans and isolated areas, as this radio has a longer range. Thanks to the radio, the air traffic controllers can communicate with the pilots and ensure safe separation between the aircraft. The radio also enables pilots to receive important information, such as the weather. Indeed, the radio is essential for a safe flight today. The gyro is the backbone of the flight instruments that inform the pilots about the aircraft's attitude and heading. This makes it possible to fly in zero visibility without losing control. A gyroscope is a relatively heavy wheel, rotating very fast and attached to a gimbal that enables the gyro to move freely. The gyro is stable in space. Idiots use this as a proof that the Earth is flat. Otherwise, aircraft will continue in a straight line into the space, right? I learned to fly an aircraft with mechanical instruments. After starting the engine, the attitude indicator is oriented with the horizon by pulling this knob. We call this caging. The aircraft must be in a horizontal position and not accelerating. Afterwards, the horizon is adjusting itself towards the center of Earth with the help of Earth's gravity. The heading indicator is set with this knob and to compensate for Earth's rotation, it is cross-checked with the magnetic compass and adjusted every 15 minutes. The turn and slip indicator is the oldest gyro instrument used in aircraft. It indicates how fast we are changing our heading. This is the cockpit of a 1931, the Havilland Tiger Moth, and you can see that the turn and slip indicator is in the center of the panel. Modern gyros are no longer mechanical, but use laser. The principle is very easy. The speed of light is constant in the same medium. A laser signal is sent in two directions to the same sensor. If the instrument housing is rotating, one of the light beams will reach the sensor before the other. And this little difference indicates a rotation. In modern aircraft, we have what we call the Attitude Heading Reference System, HSRS. It consists of three laser gyros, one for each axis and three accelerometers, also one for each axis. The heading signal is provided by a flux valve, which registers the magnetic field lines of the Earth. The aircraft I am flying has two HSRS, one for each set of flight instruments. The systems are very accurate, and today even drones are equipped with HSRS. This little unit costs less than $10. In light aircraft, the HSRS is bigger and more accurate. 
And then airliners, they are much bigger and incredibly accurate. This is the HSRS installed in ATAR aircraft. By the late 1940s, the piston engines had reached their peak, and the increased complexity made them vulnerable to failures. The DC-7, the last piston-powered airliner produced by Douglas, was often called the best three-engine airliner, because the engines failed pretty often. It was evident that a new type of power plant was needed, and that was the gas turbine. While the piston engine is made of parts moving in all directions, back and forth, up and down, the parts in the gas turbine are rotating. This makes the gas turbine simpler, lighter, and easier to produce. First patented in 1791, the early gas turbines were not able to produce excess power because the compressor required more power than the turbine could produce. It was not until 1903, Agidius Lelling, a Norwegian engineer, developed a gas turbine that was able to develop excess power, 11 horsepower to be exact. Inspired by Elling, Frank Wittel, a British engineer, developed the first gas turbine suitable for jet propulsion of aircraft. But due to little interest from the British authorities, it was the German inventor Hans von Ohain, who, independently of Wittel, designed the first jet engine suitable for flight. The first flight happened in 1939, when the Henkel 178 took to the skies. By the end of the Second World War, Germany, United Kingdom and United States had jet fighters in service. Initially, the jet engines were noisy and had poor fuel economy. This changed with the introduction of the turbofan and the turboprop. Both have a gas turbine driving a large fan or a propeller, respectively. The first jet engine had a lifespan of 10 to 20 hours before overhaul. Today's engines are very reliable and can run for thousands of hours without overhaul. Thanks to the gas turbine, air travel become affordable and most important, safer than ever. Cabin pressurization allows for airliners to fly at altitudes where the jet engines are most efficient and over most of the weather, which means less turbulence. The first airliner with a pressurized cabin was the Boeing 307 Stratoliner. It was introduced in 1940 and could cruise at 15,000 feet and maintain an air pressure of 8,000 feet inside the cabin. Modern airplanes like the Airbus 350 can fly at 40,000 feet and maintain 6,000 feet pressure in the cabin. The cabin is pressurized with air from the engine compressors this air is very hot and therefore it is cooled by air conditioning units before it enters the cabin. About half of the air is recirculated and the other half is discarded through one or more outflow valves. The cabin pressure is regulated by adjusting the opening of the outflow valves. In old aircraft, this was done manually. In modern aircraft, it's automatic. This is the cabin pressure controller in ATR aircraft. All we have to do is to insert the elevation of the destination airport. Then the controller does the rest. Thanks to cabin pressurization and the gas turbine, we can fly high above the weather in comfort and safety. How do you train pilots to handle emergencies like engine failures, fires, smoke or sudden loss of cabin pressure? In a flight simulator, of course. And when I say flight simulator, I don't mean a certain computer game, but this. A full flight simulator that can replicate everything the real aircraft can do. Inside, there is a cockpit resembling the real aircraft and a station for an instructor. The instructor can generate all kinds of weather and technical failures. The visual system is 180 to 200 degrees wide and is so realistic that your brain generates the feeling of motion. This is further enhanced by a six-axis motion system. This technical marvel costs about $15 million and requires a building four floors high and a thick concrete base to support the weight and movement of the simulator. To learn to fly an airliner like an Airbus 320 or Boeing 737, 
you will need at least 36 hours in the simulator, including a test. Then, you will come back once every six months for the current training and checking. The first simulator was less sophisticated. In 1908, the French manufacturer Antoniette started to build aircraft. The elegant aircraft became popular, but it was difficult to fly. Instead of using a stick, as is common today, the Antoniette was controlled by two wheels on the opposite sides of the cockpit. The left wheel operated the ailerons, and the right wheel operated the elevators. This was not intuitive. Therefore, in 1909, Antoniette designed a simulator called the barrel. It was made of a barrel cut in half, and with sticks and beams and wires. The first mass-produced simulator was designed by Ed Link in 1929. It was created out of the need to teach pilots how to fly by instruments. The Link train became the standard simulator during and after the Second World War and was used to train hundreds of thousands of pilots. For obvious reasons, the Link train was also called the Blue Box. For many years thereafter, the term Link Trainer became a universal description of a procedure trainer without a visual system. This is me flying an F-5 Link Trainer when I served in the Royal Norwegian Air Force. I was not a pilot, but a photographer. And I got the opportunity to fly the simulator many times. In a way, this is how I learned to fly. But I had no idea where I was. Modern simulators are divided into many categories, from flight training devices with touch screens via generic simulators, to flight simulators without motion, to the full flight simulators. Together, they are efficient tools that make aviation safer than ever. And that's all for this time. Please support my channel by sharing with your friends and all that. Thank you for watching, have a wonderful day, and happy learning!